grab a Bible, hopefully you brought one, and make your way to the book of James. James chapter 3, that's where our study is this morning as we continue a verse-by-verse study in the book of James. It really is meant to be a Bible study. So if you came in this morning without a, a Bible, we would like to let you know that we've provided them chairs nearby so you could grab one. And we did that because we really want God to speak to you this morning through His Word, believing both in the power and the effectiveness of His Word. We're hoping that you would see it, hear it, and God would just work in you all that He has. That's where we're aiming. So let's ask, take one more moment. Let's ask God together in prayer that that's exactly what would happen, that He would give you and me just an ability to hear His voice this morning. With that in mind, let's pray for it. Would you join me? Father, right now, in this moment, would you grant favor? Would you speak to us? Would you speak to us clearly by your word, by your spirit here? Would you grant us ears to hear, hearts to respond, so that, Lord, we would hear you this morning, that we will have known in this place you spoke to us today. You're that faithful. Lord, now just deal with anything that would hinder us from that and cause us to hear your voice this morning. We pray for that together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sticks and stones might break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Uh, you know it, right? It's that little kind of phrase that sometimes is given to children and to memorize, and it's a bold stand against verbal bullies. And there's something good about even trying to make that stand. That said, you probably already know. It's not really true. I mean, the reality is bones sometimes heal more readily and more quickly than the wounds that are inflicted through words. That words, I mean, they literally can affect your life. In fact, for many of you here this morning, you're struggling today with words that were spoken over your life and they hinder you from being what God wants you to be. They, they, they cause you to doubt and question because of something that was maybe spoken to you decades ago. And you st- they, still, hey, they still affect, they still work. And I just want to tell you, that's the reality. Because words are that powerful. That, in many ways, is the entire subject of James chapter 3. The power of words. Their effect and and how we deal with that and walk in that. As we approach it this morning, we come just at the after already a couple studies we've had in this chapter. And so if you've missed those, can I quickly just catch you up to speed? Or at least if you were even here, put them back in perspective. We began chapter 3 when James spoke, first of all, to teachers. And he told them because, in that sense, because of the power of the tongue, because the tongue is so powerful, he said, teachers, don't lose sight of this. There's a stricter judgment for you. That's a scary thought. That's a scary thought for all of us who are teachers, and yet it's a right one because the reality is words are powerful. And that's really where he went last time, and we talked about it as James had presented to us the power of the tongue, And he really began it by just letting us know, hey, all of us are struggling with this. He says it in verse 2, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he's a perfect man, which you're not. And so there's a sense of just saying, yeah, every single one of us is struggling with this, but it's important for us to grab it because words have such a determining force in our lives. Words have a determining impact on directing the course of our lives. And James held before us a couple of really powerful word pictures. He pictured it like a bridle and a a horse and how that you can take this massive horse with incredible power and you could steer it with with that bridle. He he gave us a picture of a ship with a, a rudder and this small little piece of metal at the rear of the ship is able to direct this massive ship. And he said the tongue is like that. The tongue it has the capability of directing our lives, of, of, of directing it down courses, uh, of leading us in that. Again, we talked about that last time and really, in many ways, tried to focus on the positive aspect of that. 
that just like a rudder can turn a ship and a bridle can turn a horse, that your tongue has the power to direct your life wherever it is you're trying to get it to go. Because that's what James said. He said, you can direct this. I mean, you, you can change this. And, and we brought that before you with a, a sense of just telling you, hey, words, they can, they can work good. They can direct things in some incredible ways. But now James wants to talk to us not about the determining force of the tongue, but the destruction of the tongue. He wants to bring before us this thought of just how powerful that can be and how much damage uh, tongues can do. And so we kind of really want to focus on that side of it, not the positive, but the detrimental, destructive impact of the tongue. That's where we are this morning, so I hope you have a Bible. And again, notice with me there, James chapter 3, beginning in verse 5. It said, even so, the tongue is a little member, and it boasts great things. See how great a forest, a little fire kindles? And the tongue is a fire. Hey, pause there. Hear that? The tongue, well, it is a fire. That, that's what we need to see. In fact, we'll change our background a little bit. We're going to add in, in that sense over there just the idea of some flames on the side of it so that you could look there and think, okay, this is what we're talking about. Words. They, they have this force that James wants to give it to us in a visual picture. He says, if you want to think about the power of the tongue, then think about it like a fire. Think about it like a flame. In fact, he gave us the picture there at the end of verse 5 in the middle of it. It says, see how great a forest, a little fire kindles. Yeah, you guys know the reality, right? A small spark can destroy an entire forest. A small spark, but in the wrong place at the wrong time, it can become that that starts a fire that destroys countless thousands, tens of thousands of acres. You guys know that, right? You can see it. In fact, even think about it this way. I have in my hand a match. Now, again, it's matchstick. The funny thing is it's really quite small, is it not? I mean, it's smaller than my pinky, but it's destructive. It could be. In the wrong place it could be, right? I mean, you think about it. I'll try to even light it here if it works this time. It's always one of those, well, we're going to go for a second one. I did that in the first service too, which is weird. There we go. So I have in my, in my hands a, a fire. Now, for some of you, just the thought that I'm holding this totally changed it. You're like, okay, honey, pastor's got flames. Get your bag. It just, it's just, I don't know, it's just a weird thing. That's, that's dangerous, pastor. Don't you know what you, I understand, that's the idea. This is a fire. If I were to throw it into this beautiful, just autumn display, it could change this room. But I'm going to put it out. I'm just going to let you guys know, I have, I have a glass of water. It's going in the water. So you, you're, you're safe. So in case you're like sitting there going, I think the, the pulpit's on fire. I mean, we just, it's, it's out. It's in the, in the glass, so you're fine. That having been said, I want to just tell you again, the crazy thing is just to understand how dangerous that is. That that little spark, that, that just a small match, it could destroy an entire forest. Now, you guys get this all the time, right? I mean, it's a part of our lives. In 2017, so far, so far, there are fires that have burned through the United States. This right now is a, is a map that shows the fires that are still yet raging in the United States. There have been 48,000 forest fires so far in 2017. 48,000 destroyed 8.2 million acres this year. Every year it's a big deal. Every year we hear about it. Every year we hear of the destruction that's taking place in the midst of forest fires. But the really scary or damaging thing about it is to understand this. 90% of all forest fires are caused by people. 10% happen because of lightning strikes or lava. 90% is people's fault. We, it, it's people that cause those forest fires, and they destroy. They destroy entire, you know, forests. They destroy homes. They can destroy a city. There have been forest fires that have killed, you know, hundreds of people, kills countless animals and all they do. I mean, they're destructive. I mean, you could see it, right? I mean, you could imagine it. Sometimes you see the pictures when they come on screens, and, and, and they tell you of forests that are on fire that are raging because of, you know, some spark that was started. That's the imagery that James wants you to think about because he wants you to understand, again, how incredibly powerful a tongue is. Though it's so small, 
though it's so small. Kent Hughes, in his commentary, says it this way, a mere spark of an ill-spoken word can produce a firestorm that annihilates everything it touches. That's exactly what happens. Sometimes just a spark, a word, creates a destructive force that destroys friendships, marriages, churches, people's lives. I mean, you can take a, a, a word that's spoken wrongly, and it can, it can set a flame that will just, inc- just destroy so very much. That's why it told us, and we talked about this last week more in detail, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. Proverbs 18, death and life. They're in the power of the tongue. That's what James is trying to convince us, and he does so again by just telling us, hey, the tongue is a fire. It's a fire that's a destructive fire. It's one that you need to see, and maybe, maybe right there, that's enough for you. Maybe you're like convinced, and I think that would be amazing. But James, he doesn't end. Just in case you're not really getting it, in case you don't really understand what he's trying to say, he's going to add on to it four more kind of pictures to it that'll help us understand it. Notice with me. Continue reading. We'll just go there in verse 6. He says, And the tongue is a fire. It's a world of iniquity. A world of iniquity. The word world here is used in really quite a similar way to it's often used within our culture. I mean, you hear it, right? You'll hear about the wide world of sports. Or you'll see some business that advertise, hey, this is a world of bicycles or the world of, uh, of turquoise. And you know what they're doing when they advertise it. It's in a sense saying, we have all of it. We have, we cover the entire gamut. And that's what James says. He says, you know, when you look at sin, the tongue, it's, it's all of it. Wherever there's sin, wherever there's destruction, the tongue is a part of that. The tongue is a part of that destruction. David Guzik would say it this way. It is though all the wickedness in the whole world were wrapped up in that little piece of flesh, the tongue. It's like everything in the world that's wrong with our world, the tongue is a part of it. Everything that's broken, everything that's destructive, the tongue is a part of that. The tongue is part of, of seeing that done. Wherever there's sin, there are words that are a part of it. In fact, as he continues that, keep reading verse 5, sorry, verse 6, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. Yeah, the tongue defiles everything. I mean, he says, you know, though the tongue is just a small portion of your physical body, if you could see its damage, there's not anything that the tongue isn't destroying. Everywhere that there is, every part of mankind, wherever it is, there's a damage of the tongue in the midst of it. The tongue, it messes up everything. It defiles everything. He then continues, the tongue, verse 6 again, is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and it sets on fire the course of nature. The tongue sets on fire the course of everything that's wrong, of all of nature. Now, actually, this is quite a fascinating word. James does this, and if anybody's interested, he he uses a word here that's kind of fascinating. It has the idea that the tongue sets on fire the wheel of life, would be almost even a translation of it. And the idea is, okay, what are you saying? I mean, what, what is that communicating? Well, it has the idea that it's that which propels it forward. It, it's that which is making it possible for it to move. Now, in the back of my mind, just got to be honest, when I was thinking that through this week, it got stuck in my head, so I'm sharing it with you. I just could hear it. The wheels of the bus go round and round, round. That's kind of where it goes. Like, that's, kind of, that's all I could think of. It's like, but that's the idea. It's like, this is carrying it forward. This is greasing the path. The tongue is, is that wherever there is wrong, wherever, I mean, the tongue, it starts it all. Whether it's the Holocaust or murder, whether it's a divorce or a character assassination, it happens through words. Words propel that. Words are the thing that starts that whole thing rolling. It's words that keep that ball rolling. It's words that carry sin into its destination and destruction. Proverbs would say it to us this way in Proverbs 26, like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I was only joking, just kidding. (laughs) 
<laughs> it's just like one of those problems is worth because it's such a powerful picture. It's not like you can say, here's this guy who's like throwing death and firebrands and, and, and just arrows. And then it's like, just kidding, didn't mean it. <laughs> you know, take that back. Didn't really, didn't really mean all those words I just said. It's like, that doesn't work. And he says it this way, because where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. If you could take away those words that are continuing, just propelling that forward, it would stop. It's words that keep the damage going. It's words that keep that destruction moving. He says, as a charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Yeah, that's how it happens. It's words. In fact, in Proverbs 16, it would say it this way. An ungodly man digs up evil. It is on his lips like a burning fire. A perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. He says, here's this ungodly man, and they just, it's as if he loves digging up dirt, loves finding out something wrong, loves doing it, and then it's like this flame on his lips, and he can't wait to share it, and then he shares it, and, and he sows that strife, and friendships are destroyed. Best of friends are separated because of what words can do. Words destroy. Words bring in destruction. They set on fire all that's wrong in our world. I mean, words are a part of that. And if that wasn't clear enough, well, he adds another picture. Verse 6, just starting again at the beginning. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. And it sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. Yeah. The tongue is set on fire by hell. What does that mean? Well, let's just think this through for a moment, because maybe you need the reminder. i got to admit, even though I know better, I need the reminder. When we think about hell, hell is not Satan's domain. Sometimes that's how it's pictured, right? Because that's how cartoons picture him as some little red, you know, guy in a hood, some stick figure, and it's as if, you know, hell is his dominion. Hell is not his dominion. The Bible tells us that Satan is here. He's the prince of the power of the year. He's working in the hidden realms of our world that he's here. He's not in hell yet. Hell was created not as his domain, but as his destruction. It's his prison tells us in Revelation that he's going to be cast into hell. But here's the sad part. All of rebellious mind, mankind is going to be tossed in there as well. Everybody who's rejecting Jesus, they're going to be going into hell with him. It's destruction. So in other words, this isn't Satan's power. This is his destination. And that's kind of what he's wanting us to understand. Because what he's telling us is, this hell that's coming, that's going to destroy sin in this world, words are compelling that. It's, it, it is both the, the fuel that is firing up in one sense man's rebellion, but it's also as if those words are carrying people there. See, this is that present participle. For you English, people that don't really like English, you don't need to remember that except to understand this. It's a present thing. It's not a past thing. It's not like just saying, hey, this is what started everything. It's the idea that it's continually involved in it, that hell is so much a part of this, that in one sense, the, the very destruction that's working in our world that's sending people to hell is fueling this, and this thing is fueling hell. Kent Hughes maybe says it better than I did. He says it this way. He says, the uncontrolled tongue has a direct pipeline to hell. This pipeline is reciprocal. Fueled by hell, it burns our lives with its filthy fires but it is also an instrument for encouraging and sending people into the fires of hell. It's just words, they, they, they are that which is connected to hell, but it's as if they're encouraging people to go there. They're harsh words. They become that which grease the wheels, that push people along. They're helping people on their downward descent towards an eternal destruction. And you just need to understand how incredibly dangerous that is. Ken Hughes goes on to say it this way. Taking James' words seriously we recognize that the tongue has more destructive power than a hydrogen bomb. For the bomb's power is physical and temporal, where the tongue's is spiritual and eternal. Okay, did I, did I make this In other words, your tongue has more ability to do damage than a nuclear weapon. 
I mean, a nuclear weapon can destroy cities and, and, and lives, but you could destroy somebody's eternity with your tongue. That our tongue can compel that. And it says, that's what I'm wanting you to understand, how incredibly dangerous this is, that a tongue used wrongly, words flowing wrongly, they can become so destructive. And I mean, you just got to just kind of appreciate how James is doing this, how he's working so hard to get it. I mean, you should be able to kind of sit there and go, so I wonder what James thinks about the tongue. It's like, I, think I know what he thinks about the tongue. It's like, that's a fire. That'll destroy lives. That's hell it is. I mean, that's what it does. The tongue is connected to that. And just as if you could see it and understand what he's saying, it's a big deal. So what do you do with that? Well, again, that's the whole chapter. We're working through it, and we have more to understand. But let's think about this right now. And as we're trying to process what James has just told us about the tongue, what do you do with this this morning? What should this mean to you? Well, God is big, and he might have more than I have understanding. But I want to give you three things to think about this morning. The first, and it really goes into everything I've just tried to say, is I'm just calling you to believe it. I'm just calling you to really understand how powerful words are, how destructive they are. I mean, you think about it, James has painted the picture of a forest fire, right? And that's the idea. A little spark can destroy an entire forest. And for so many of you, you can see it. You've seen the posters. You got Smokey Bear, you know, right there in the poster saying, only you can prevent forest fires. I mean, if anybody in the nation should appreciate that, it should be you guys. I mean, if you don't know, Smokey Bear, he's like, he's like ours. I mean, it's just right up here at Capitan is where it happens. You can go up there and go to Smokey Bear Museum and, and see it and, and talk. And the, the whole thing started here. It's this idea of understanding how damaged they are. And that little image has become something that literally hundreds of thousands of dollars has been poured into to try to convince people through ads, through stamps, through stickers, through movies. I mean, I could just show you hundreds and hundreds of pictures, and you could probably add to them right now where just Smokey would be just reasoning, saying, it's up to you to do this. I mean, you can stop this. Why does the, why, what's the point? Because they know what I've tried to tell you this morning. 90% of all forest fires is our fault. Some of it's arson. That's just true. But most of it's carelessness. There's a good-sized statistic of it that's cigarettes thrown out a window. There's a percentage of it that's campfires that weren't rightly taken care of. There's a percentage of it that was just, you know, letting kids kind of play with flames and weren't paying attention to it. Maybe the largest part of it is, is people who are burning their refuse and, and just thought they could handle it. And they couldn't. So, so what is Smokey the Bear about that? Because he's trying to tell people, this is more damaging than you could think. There have been 48,000 fires so far in 2017. 90% of those are mankind's fault. And if you could interview most of those people who are a part of it, they would have told you, I just didn't think it would happen to me. I mean, I didn't really, I mean, I, I, mean, I know you always see the Smokey Bear kind of thing, but I just didn't, I mean, I just was burning this little thing. I didn't think it would get out of control. I didn't think that it could become that destructive. And so why the ads? Why the over? Because they're trying to tell people, yes, it can. It might be you. Don't let it be you. Don't let you be one of that 90% that are destroying forests because of your carelessness and folly. And so it's trying to tell us that, hey, here's the problem. Even though we're kind of comfortable with seeing Smokey Bear, we probably don't get it. And there's the danger. See, I think about it. You'll go to, to, to you know, four sites and you'll see those signs that will tell you, hey, you know, it's either dangerous or not dangerous, fires, open fires, not. All that, again, to try to tell you, hey, don't be a part of this. And what James is doing, trying to get a hold of us, is to say the same thing. And I could be mistaken, but I'm going to tell you what I think. I don't think you really believe it. Oh, don't get me wrong. I bet you there's not anybody here in the room who totally disagrees with what I just said. I think most of you would understand, hey, sticks and stones might break my bones, but names actually do hurt. And you kind of believe it. But you don't believe it enough. You don't really get it. You don't really think that your words could destroy as much as they can. That your words wrongly spoken might be a part of sending somebody else to hell that your words could destroy, and yet that's what James is trying to tell us right now. And if you could get one thing out of this message, you just need to believe it. You need to believe that words 
are more powerful than maybe you thought. That words are what is compelling and carrying sin along the course that's happening in this world. So that's the first thing. With that, let me give you kind of a second thing to think through, and I really want to encourage you with, with the, only the ability to overcome it. Now, track with me for a moment, because I'm going to deviate for a moment. I'm a rabbit trail just for a moment, and then I'm going to come back. We're going to come back to the main thing, which is challenging us to handle our own tongues. But I found myself just praying through it this week and thinking through what the Lord would have for us, and I really felt like part of what I needed to tell you is, you know, words really are that damaging. They really are that destructive but you can overcome them. See, here's the thing. I know this. I know that for some of you, quite honestly, you are hindered right now. There's something that somebody said about you, again, maybe even decades ago, that right now is hindering you from obeying what God has for you. Maybe there's a calling on your life to do something. Maybe you're supposed to be leading a Bible study, or maybe you're supposed to be leading a worship, but somebody said something about you decades ago, and to this day, you still struggle with what that was said. To this day, you struggle with, with what that is. And I just want to tell you, words are that powerful. But they can be overcome. I mean, words are something that all of us are struggling with. There's not anybody that doesn't. So I know this, it's a part of your life. But I want to tell you, it's possible to overcome the damage. It's possible, if you want to think about it this way, if you want to think about the tongue being a fire, if you really believe it, you would have some fire prevention kind of tactics within your life. Much like some of you, many of you guys have smoke detectors in your homes got a little fire extinguisher somewhere there because you're like, my house is not burning down. We are going to do what we can because I know a little flame started could destroy everything. So I've actually taken precautions so that if a fire happens, I can put it out. Well, in, in the similar way, I want to challenge you in your life, you should have that. So what are they? Well, let me just give you a few thoughts. They're just random, and they're just kind of from me and, and where I would come with this. There's more that you could add to it, and maybe God would take it further than I've done. But just a few things. I just want to tell you, first of all, you ought to so recognize the damage of words, and you should steer clear of toxic tongues. You should steer clear. In other words, you should be the kind of person that says, you know, I am not going to put myself in that location where, where, where that's going to be destroying. Now, again, you can't escape all of it. <laughs> There's not anybody in the world that's not struggling with their tongue. So it's not like you can ever escape it. At the same point, there are choices you can make that would move yourself out of that place where that's happening. See, I think about what it tells us in 1 Corinthians. It says, do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. It says, don't be the kind of person that doesn't believe that words could actually hurt you. Well, yeah, they're so mean. It's so cruel. But you know what? <laughs> they're my friend. You know, they just, they, they say these crazy dumb things. But you know what? It's not really going to affect me. Really? Do you think that words aren't going to affect you? Yeah, I, I listen to these songs, and yeah, some of these songs, they're really bad songs. They say some terrible things, but they're just words. It's not like words are actually going to affect me. Really? You don't think words are what's compelling, wrong in our world. I mean, words are going to hurt you, and you need to make choices where it would say it this way in Proverbs, he who walks with wise men will be wise. The companion of fools will be destroyed. Hey, you should make some choices that would say, I am not going to, you know, intentionally allow that to continually be a place in my life. There are choices sometimes that need to be made where you say, that's going to hurt me. It's going to hurt me, and I'm not going to go there. But again, you can't avoid all of it. So the second thing, and maybe it's the most important thing I want to say in this regard, is that you need to find your identity in Christ. Colossians says, in Christ who is our life. I mean, it's this idea that we find this, and there's so much I could say here, in fact, hundreds of things. But I just want to tell you, that's where God has called you to find your significance, your reason for living, your point of your existence is Christ. And there are things that you are struggling with here this morning that if you would believe Jesus, those things would begin to lose power in your life. If you would begin to believe that he who formed you in the womb made you, if you began to believe that you're his workmanship created for a good purpose, if you began to believe some of the things that God would say about you, it could nullify some of those words that were altogether destructive and bad. And I just want to tell you, you could do that. I'm going to tell you, there's this place of finding our life in Jesus that, you know, it doesn't really matter what others say about me as much as what Jesus says. And if it's going to be a choice of whether I believe what they said or what God says, I'm going to take God. 
I'm going to find my identity in him. Again, so much I could say. There's so many verses, but I think I want to just quickly just tell you, give you a picture. One of my favorite pictures of this is the man Joseph. There at the end of the book of Genesis, you might know his story. I mean, here's a man whose who's other people's words destroyed his life. Maybe beginning with his dad that played favorites, then his brothers who were jealous and, and decided, decided to capture him and almost kill him, sell him into slavery. Whether it be Potiphar's wife who because of her own just frustration that Joseph wouldn't do what she wanted, uses her words to, to destroy him so that he ends up in prison. I mean, here's a man whose other people's words have really had a detrimental effect. But you get to the end of his life, and he becomes a blessing to his brothers. He, he rescues his dad. If you don't know the whole story, go read it. It's the end of the book of Genesis. But you get this amazing story in Genesis 50 where his brothers are there and their dad passes and they start to panic thinking that maybe Joseph is going to do to them what they did to him. And and so they tell him in Genesis 50 verse 15, it says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, perhaps (laughs) Joseph will hate us and he may actually repay us for all the evil we did to him. I mean, it's like, Dad, when dad was here, they didn't do it. <laughs> Maybe it was all because of dad. And now that dad's not there, <gasps> Maybe there's a fire burning inside Joseph. Maybe we started a flame that is waiting to come out and now destroy us in the same way that we tried to destroy him. And, and so they concoct this crazy scheme. They come up with this kind of way of thinking that their dad had asked Joseph to forgive him. And they approach Joseph saying, hey, please don't do to us what we deserve. And Joseph responds to them. He said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? He says, guys, that's that's not my place. It's not my place to judge you. It's not my place to fix your life. It's not my place to give you what you deserve. He says, "I, I, I figured out that I need to give that over to God. And then he says, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it out as it is this day to save many people alive. Joseph's able to look and says, you know what, when you did those things, when you said those things, you really did mean to hurt me. You did. But something's happened in Joseph. He's not defined by what they did or said about him. He says, you know what, my definition of my life is God's working. And he's working all this together for good in my life. And so actually, he has me here for a purpose. There's a place of finding your identity, thinking I am not defined by what people did to me. I'm not a victim of of other people's cruelty. I'm a child of God. And God has me here on purpose. And God's, God's working in my life. And even though you meant it evil, God has turned it for good so that I could be a blessing here. That's what he tells him. In fact, he says, now therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Hey, don't don't miss that. Come back to that in just a moment. He spoke kindly. They spoke cruelly. He speaks kindly. That's a good example of just saying he finds his identity in in, in what God has for him. And I want to tell you, your identity can be found there. Now, if your identity is going to be found in Jesus, you're going to have to forgive. That is not an option. That people have hurt you has happened. That people have said mean things to you and about you has happened. But you have to forgive them. I mean, Jesus said it this way when he tells us, and we're praying for forgiveness, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And he goes on to say, but if you won't forgive them, God's not going to forgive you either. This is essential. This is a part of our lives. Now, I like it that this is part of the Lord's Prayer. Some of you know that I think the Lord's Prayer is a model for us that we could pray almost through it every day. And if it is so, then this idea of forgiveness, it's not a one-time thing. It's a daily maintenance. It's not like, I did that, I forgave him. Let's see, that was back in 2010. That's like, I forgave him, and I'm still forgiving him. I have to come every day and say, God, you know what? I just let him go. That is not mine. That is not mine. You know, I'm asking for their, I need to let go of this. I don't need to let their words stay poisoned in my soul. I, I need to forgive them and let that go. There is a place of forgiveness where you have to do that. But there's one more thing I want to say. That is that if you're going to do this, if you're going to overcome those words, you're going to have to become that one. Instead of doing bad, you do the good thing. See, that's what Jesus said. Jesus was talking to his disciples and he said, he says, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. 
Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. He says, don't, don't, don't give back to them what they gave to you. He says, the world can do that. I'm calling you to a higher standard. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to be best friends with somebody who's cruel. That does, this doesn't invalidate my first point, which there are times you make choices to say, that's not going to be a relationship that's good for me. But you know what? I can, I can, I can pray for you, and I can bless you. I can say good, to, even though you said bad to me, I can say good to you. Though you talked bad about me, I'm not going to jump in the mud and start slinging it back. I'm, I'm going to do what's right. In fact, I like the way it gives it to us in Romans. It says, if it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. <laughs> I like that. Just so practical. It's not always possible with everybody else. Sometimes people won't do it. But on your side, you be peaceable. You be that person that says, I, I, I am no longer fighting. I'm not in the midst of that. He says, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. He says, you know, to, to let other people off the hook doesn't mean they're getting away with it. It means you're letting God deal with it. That's what Joseph did, right? Joseph said, am I in the place of God? That's God's place. God is the one who will deal with sin. God is the one who, I mean, Jesus said that every word is going to be accounted for in the judgment. I mean, you can trust him to handle the hard things that have been done and said about you, but you just need to give them to him. It's like, God, God's your God. He's not mine. Instead, he says, here's what you need to do. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hey, just catch that last sentence. Do not be overcome with evil. Overcome evil by good. You make the choice that you're not going to speak back to them. In fact, you're going to do them good. And I like this word overcome. It's kind of what I've used for that whole, this whole section is that you can overcome hard words. I, I like it. The Bible talks about it as Christians. That's actually a definition of who we are. We are overcomers. We are more than overcomers, more than conquerors in Christ. When Jesus writes the letters in Revelation, he ends every letter that he writes to the seven churches. To him who overcomes. That's who we are. That's who we are. And I just want to tell you, we are to be those who overcome the pain, who overcome the hurdles, and we do that by finding Christ to, to be our life, forgiving and blessing. And I just want to tell you, for some of you, that it is, is so present. It's so much what you need today. And I just want to tell you, you don't have to be a victim to those words. They're serious. But you can overcome them. Okay, if I've lost you, come back, because I rabbited out, and now I'm rabbiting back. You know, so we were over there for a second. I just want to tell you, okay, here's James telling us we, the tongues of fire. It's a world of iniquity. It defiles everything. The entire course of life is, is set on fire by the tongue, and it's connected to hell. You need to believe that, not in a way that creates fear that you can't overcome it. You can overcome it, and you should. But obviously, the main point for you and I is to change the way that we speak, to change the way that you and I talk. The idea is that, that we ought to be those, if we get this, it should affect what we say so that we recognize that that's not what we want to let our tongue do. The best way I can think about doing this is to do what I did the last time. If you guys were here for our last study, I gave you a seven-day challenge. And I just challenged you, hey, for seven days, just, just be aware of your words. Be aware of how your words can change the entire conversation, how you can change the atmosphere of a room how you can change the atmosphere of a day. Just realize the effect that your words have. Well, today I want to repeat that challenge with a slight, slight change. Now, I think you get this. My point of a seven-day challenge isn't so that at the end of the seven days you can be like, that's good, I'm not doing that ever again. Whew. No, it's the idea that it should develop some habits that would change. And I want to challenge you to think about your words before you say them. I want to challenge you to, to, to process what you're saying, and evaluate if you should say it before you say it. Now, it didn't originate with me, but THINK is a good acronym. You can find it on, on memes all over the internet and those kinds of things where you take the five letters to the word THINK and, and put it in an acronym that just, before you speak, ask, is it true? Is it true? I mean, telephone tag works with adults like it does with kids, and we get things messed up. Is it actually true what I'm saying? Is it helpful? Would I actually help them? Is it inspiring? 
Is it actually going to compel them forward spiritually? Is it necessary? Do I need to say this, and is it kind? I mean, is it the kind thing to say? And if it isn't, you should be able to say, I'm not going to say it. I mean, you ought to be able to evaluate with what you're going to say, think that through, and then my challenge is again to you is hold back those harsh words. Your words which would inflame. Your words which would be destructive. Your words that could do that. That's what the Bible calls us to. Paul would say it this way to us in Ephesians. He says, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. He says, don't let a destroying word, a word that's like a fire, a word that would burn people and hurt people and leave destruction in its wake. Don't let any corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to your hearers. He says, you ought to be thinking about it. He says, you know, if, if, before I speak, I ought to think, I don't, I don't want to say a corrupting thing. I want to filter my words before I say them so that I don't say something destructive. I want to do the acronym THINK. I want to, is it, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? I mean, is it that way? And, and maybe that'll just land for somebody. You can think, okay, I just want to process that through first, and, and I don't want to let those things flow out of my mouth. My challenge is that you would do that, and here's specifically, for this week, I just want you to be aware of what you don't say. I want you to be very aware of what you keep yourself from saying. I mean, you're the only one that will know if you do it right, you and God. But I'd like it if you would be able to end conversations or even a day and realize, you know, I could have said those things. And that would have, that would have hurt. That could have, that could have brought in pain and sorrow, destruction, and I didn't say them. I think that's a good thing. In fact, I, I, maybe I just need to camp on that for a quick moment because we live in such a weird culture that sometimes they, they embrace the opposite of this, almost as if it's a virtue. Almost as if, you know, like, hey, man, I have no filter. I just say everything I think, and this is a really good thing. I just, it's like, I just want to tell you, that is not a really, if you say everything you think, well, let me tell you what God says. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. I'm just saying, God's saying, if you say everything that comes into your mind, you are a fool. You should not let everything that comes in there come out. You should be able to evaluate and say, I am not going to say that. That's harmful. That's mean. That would be hurtful. That could, that could really discourage them. I don't want to do that. I want to encourage people. I mean, I should be the kind of person that, that values that, and I hold things back. And I'm just telling you right now, maybe you already knew that, but again, we live in this world world that some people almost think it's a virtue to say everything they think. It is no virtue. It's a virtue to think, I am not going to let my tongue hurt people. I'm going to do my best to not let that happen. In fact, Proverbs would say it this way. Even a fool is counted wide when he, wise when he holds his peace. When he shoves his lips, he's considered perceptive. Hey, there's hope for some of us here. Because some of us are fools. And we're like, I, I, I say the wrong thing all the time. If you hold your words back, people will think, man, they're so smart. It's like, oh, you, you just don't know what I didn't say. That's why you think that. You know, it's just because I have held my tongue, you know, because my tongue is not always going the right direction. In fact, it gives it to us this way in Proverbs 10. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. It says if you just talk and let yourself just talk, sin's going to be found there and you're going to hurt people. But if you restrain your lips, if you're thinking it through and saying, I don't say everything I think, and I do that intentionally. That's what God's calling us to. Hey, it even works into our vocabulary, maybe it'll work for somebody. During World War II, they used to have a slogan that, again, has worked its way into our daily vocabulary. If you didn't know where it came from, loose lips might sink ships. Hey, in the days before satellite technology and spying, during World War II, one of the best ways that the enemy could get intel on what was happening with the army was through people's loose lips, where somebody might just be talking in a casual conversation. Oh, yeah, my brother-in-law, he's on this destroyer. They're on their way over to uh, South Seas. You know, he's like, oh, really? Thank you. So we were kind of curious. What, what destroyer was that again? Okay. I mean, it's, uh, the idea was, was that the intel was being gathered through people's just folly, to just letting their lips just run, just saying, he said, you know what, you need to be careful what you say so that the enemy can't use what you would say to hurt other people. I didn't even tell you that's a great model. Don't let your lips sink ships. Think it through that. I don't, I don't want my words to carry somebody to hell. 
I don't want my words to carry somebody to destruction. I don't want my words to do that. And so I'm going to think it through, and I'm not going to let everything flow out of there that comes in there. I'm going to be somebody that does that. And I'm just challenging you for the next seven days. Be very aware of it. Extra aware. So that, again, you could end a conversation or you could end a day, and between you and God, just realize, God, this is what I didn't say. Thank you. Thank you that I didn't say this or this or this, and only God knows in you. But I just want to challenge you to be aware of it and to attempt it because words are destructive. I mean, James is just telling us words are a fire, that words would do this, that words would be this place where it, the, the world of iniquity is found there. It, words could defile everything. It sets on fire all that's wrong in our world. And it's connected to hell. And James is telling this and, and challenging us just to value that and to not go there. So that, that's your challenge. That's your seven-day challenge. And I think that God would make it more meaningful in your life than I could ever make it because I'm just telling you words are more powerful than I've yet said. Well, that's kind of what we need to think about, but one more thing, one more thing, and then we'll close. We've really camped on the negative this morning. And again, that's because that's what James is telling us. He's just wanting us to understand how destructive words are, and they are. He means it. Words, words carry people to hell. Words destroy lives every day. And, and there's a, a reality that we need to understand about this. But words can go both ways, right? And that's what we talked about last week a little bit, last time a little bit. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Yes, death is in the power of the tongue but so is life. And it's a fascinating thing that I wonder if God didn't do it intentionally this way. So we think about the tongue described as a fire, and maybe you already have thought about this, but if not, let me just quickly tell you, it's a fascinating thing. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. The Holy Spirit descends for the very first time, really inhabiting the life of every believer with an intention that all of us now get to be his representatives in this world. And it tells us when the day of Pentecost had fully come in Acts 2, verse 1, there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And it sat on each one of them. And it's kind of a crazy picture, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if you ever think about it, like, I wonder why, why did it do that? I mean, I mean, God did it. He can do whatever he wants to do. But I mean, what, what, was, what was significant about this tongue of fire? Well, it's an interesting thing. There is a part of the tongue that's connected to hell that fuels the flames of hell, but there's another fire. There's another fire that is the fire of the Holy Spirit that doesn't bring in destruction, but it brings in life, that burns away sin and enlivens and awakens hearts towards passion and purpose. There's a fire that can happen through a tongue that instead of destroying other people can bring people life. And it's a fire as well, but it's a good fire. It's a heavenly fire. I think about it in Romans. It would give it to us this way. How then shall they call on him whom they've not believed? How shall they believe on him whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Or said in a very simple way, how do people get saved? It's words. God has ordained that it happens through words that the gospel of Jesus Christ is carried out by words. How can somebody believe in Jesus if they don't hear about him? They can't. That's how God's decided to do it. He's determined that if they're going to call on him, they're going to they're gonna believe on him, they're going to have to hear and to hear. They're not going to be able to hear unless somebody preaches it. Now, the word preach here, it doesn't mean ordained pastor the word preacher means proclaimer, literally, which is what all of us are supposed to be. And the idea is, how can they hear without your words? They can't. How does your neighbor, your coworker, your friend, how can you save them from hell? Your words. Your words can carry them down, or your words can, can send them up. Your words can go one of two directions, and he's challenging us to let it be the right way. Because he goes on to say that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I mean, it's us telling him what God believes, explaining God's word to him that can change lives. So can I just turn that and say, if that's you this morning, if in the midst of this you're like, here and you don't know Jesus, and you're like, I don't even know what to do with this message this morning. I mean, maybe you kind of got it. Words are destructive. How do you overcome? Well, there's only one way, and that's Jesus. 
Jesus is the one that rescues lives, fixes life, and rescues them from that descent that's on a descent towards hell and turns them around. And how do you believe that? Because I'm telling you. That's the gospel. The gospel happens through words. Words are powerful. Words can carry great meaning and light. And I want to tell you the tongues of fire, and it can go one of two ways, but I'm hoping that my tongue has gone one direction this morning to draw you to Jesus. And I'm praying that it's so if you don't know Jesus, you would come to today. And I'm praying for your tongues that they would do the same. Well, that's where we're going to end. So you can close your Bibles and notebooks, and I just want to just take a few moments and just encourage you right now. We've talked about it. Just again, it's, it's real. It's present. Words are a part of our lives. But I am challenging you to be aware of it. Words destroy lives. They destroy people, friendships, marriages. They hinder people. They rob people. Be aware of your words. This week, if you'll take the challenge, be aware of your words and be aware of what you do not say. Catch yourself before they flow out. Things that might have hurt, things that you realized, I did not need to say that. That is not going to go well. There's no reason to say that. Catch yourself. And may God cause it so that our words are connected to heaven and not hell. With that as a name, would you join me right now in prayer? God, I thank you so much for your word, and your word speaks to us the truth. I thank you for that. God, I I hope this morning that in the midst of this, my words have conveyed truth. If it's so, then Lord, it's both interesting but scary. Words are so much more powerful than probably we've ever locked our understanding into Words carry people to hell. And words, the gospel spoken, can rescue people and send them to heaven. Words. God, would you so work in us that just the way you described it there in Ephesians, that we would let no corrupting word come out of our mouths that you would help us to become those who are aware of it, of how our words can hurt, wound, and destroy. And we catch them. We catch those words before they come out. God, teach us. Show us. Draw us to what you have in this. Lord, I, I know you can do better than I've done. Make it real. Make it effective. Lord, meet us and rescue us. We pray in this broken world. As I'm praying for that, I would be remiss if I didn't take just a quick moment and pray for that ability to overcome cruel and harsh words. Lord, there are literally people in this room here this morning, and they are absolutely in shackles because of words. There are things that you've called them to do, and they're afraid to do them because of criticism that they've received. There are people that are just bound in just a darkness and an unbelief over what you tell us about us because of words. God, would you rescue? Would you help us overcome those things which were spoken that were cruel and harsh and even satanic in many ways? God, would you just help us to become overcomers and because you are and just draw us into that. I pray for that right now. And may it affect all of our life. Teach us, Lord, I'm asking for that right now and just praying that you would help us. Help us right now with our tongues. I've given you a moment, want to give you a moment, I should say. I began you in prayer, but I want to give you just a moment. We do this each week, and it's just going to be a moment for you to stop and think about. It's quiet. Maybe a conversation that you can have with God and begin one. I believe God is really faithful, and there's probably something very specific He had from you for you here this morning. And the really fun thing about that is it's probably different all around the room. It'd be great if you just take a moment just to have a conversation with God about what He's talking to you about. And I'm hoping that it's a start to a conversation that will continue happening as you leave this place, maybe this afternoon into this evening, this week. Just you and God talking about what he's talking to you about. So just a quiet moment so that you can begin that and and not rush out of here without kind of grabbing that.
Would you do that quietly? I'll do the same, and then we'll close and worship in just a moment. God, you said that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I thank you so much for your word that you have given to us, that you've given to instruct us and show us what you have. You said that your word is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. Lord, maybe it's been that way this morning that your word has corrected us and it's exposing things that we've allowed to take place in our life that we should not. Would you correct us? And then would you instruct us as you said your word does? You would instruct us in righteousness so that we could be just ready to live a godly life for you. Would you teach us about our tongues? May your word be that which instructs us in that. I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If God has met you this morning, and again, you don't have a relationship with Jesus, it is through words, and we'd love to talk to you about Jesus in a, in, a, in a greater way than I've done right now. If you don't know Jesus, we just want to tell you that he is the hope of mankind. He's the only way to be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. And if that's not what you have right now, you don't have a relationship with him, we'd like to talk to you about that. Pastor Phil will be up here at the end of the service following the song, and you're welcome to make your way up if that's a place where you have questions. Or maybe you just need prayer. Hey, we'd love to have you be here. Phil's here. I'll be in the back. You can grab one of us or even grab somebody around you. But right now, let's just make God our focus and worship him. So would you stand? We're going to close in, in just a, a worship song, just celebrating what God is and is doing and his ways. And as we do that, I just want to give you a blessing as, I, as we finish my part for this morning. Again, I do this every week, but I just want to tell you its purpose to it. In number six, God gave an instruction to Moses. says, when you bless my people, bless them like this, he says. Because he says, this is who I am. This is my name. This is my character. He says, I want you to bless my people and bless them this way. He says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Seated above. Seated above, enthroned in the Father's love. Destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, but suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory is yours. Savior, worthy of honor and glory. Awesome in power forever. 
awesome and great is your name. You overcame. Power in hand. Power in hand. Speaking the Father's plan. Sending us out. Light in this broken land. All authority, every victory is yours. Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all our praise. Jesus, awesome and power forever, awesome and great is your name. You overcame. We'll overcome. And we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony everyone overcome we will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony everyone overcome Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all our praise, you overcame. Jesus, awesome in power forever, awesome and great is your name. Overcame. You overcame. You overcame. You overcame. You overcame. You overcame. Father, we do rejoice in you, and Lord Jesus, you that you have overcome the world. And, Lord, in your strength, in your power, Lord, you make us overcomers. We thank you for the word we've heard. And now, Lord, to live it out, Lord, give us strength, give us help, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful afternoon.